Hello everybody, I'm your host Hal Curtis and I'd like to welcome you to The Space Industry by SatSearch, where we share stories about the companies taking us into orbit. In this podcast, we delve into the opinions and expertise of the people behind the commercial space organisations of today who could become the household names of tomorrow. Before we get started with the episode, remember you can find out more information about the suppliers, products and innovations that are mentioned in this discussion on the global marketplace for space at satsearch.com. Hello and welcome to today's episode. I'm joined today by Michael Seidel, systems engineer uh, with a focus on space applications, and Adrian Helwig, analog field application engineer, both from Texas Instruments. Now, Texas Instruments, or TI as it's often known, is an electronics manufacturer that you've probably heard of. And today we're going to be talking about phased array antennas in satellite communications, and specifically about how to optimize beamforming when using such systems. So firstly, I'd just like to say hello to you both, to Michael and Adrian. Thank you very much for being here today. Hello. Glad to be here. Great. Thank you. Okay, so let's get into this topic. It's a very interesting topic and quite technical, but I think has quite a lot of um, applications and and bearing on on modern uh, satellite communications applications. So clocking is receiving more and more attention in RF applications today. Can you explain why this topic is possibly more important today than it has been in the past. Uh, To to Michael, please. Clocking has indeed become very important. Uh, This is mainly due to the fact that the speed of data converters has reached extremely high rates of meanwhile, greater than 10 giga samples per second, which is great as it enables designers to directly sample the RF signals without the need for any down mixing to an intermediate frequency anymore. But sampling rates of greater than 10 giga samples per second translate into very short sampling periods of less than 100 picoseconds. It is obvious that any clock chatter of a few picoseconds or more does already degrade the system performance quite a bit. Exactly. Another way to look at this uh, is that the SNR performance as a function of clock jitter is dependent on the input frequency of the signal. So in other words, for a given amount of jitter, SNR degradates more with higher frequency signal than with lower one. So we really see that for higher frequency systems, low clock jitter becomes more and more important. Okay, I see. So as we're seeing more and more use of higher frequencies in in the in the industry, then we need that low clock jitter to enable the applications to achieve the, the sensitivity they need. But but it's not just higher frequencies that make clocking so important, right? I mean, also the the use of phased array antennas, as I mentioned, increases the importance of clocking, uh, as far as I understand it. So could you give us a brief introduction to the use of phased array antennas in space applications, and specifically, like what problems do they solve and, and what benefits they offer over alternatives? Correct. Phased array antennas are the second important trend. Phased array antennas offer electronic beamforming and steering capabilities that can bring a host of possibilities for emerging applications, uh, such as satellite broadband, uh, so that they remove the limitation of physically moving the antenna and they are allowed to adjust the beam to follow the highest concentration of users. Phased array antennas are also referred to ESAs electronically steered antennas. As there are no moving parts, ESAs uh, provide much higher agility for steering the antenna beam. Right, great, which is a a really important challenge because obviously achieving sensitivity of um, in attitude and and, uh, in agile satellites requires a lot of of additional hardware and and, uh, control of the system. So that's interesting. And I uh, thank you for mentioning the satellite broadband application. It really makes it clear why these uh, systems are are in use. So it sounds like there's there's still a number of chances that would exist in such systems. And yeah, I mean, I guess, Adrian, this is your field. I wonder if you could explain some of the typical challenges you see designers facing when developing phased array antennas. Yeah, that's a great question. In the latest phased arena systems, we see a lot of elements integrated. There may be dozens of elements in some systems, up to hundreds or even more in some cases. And the higher the number of elements, the more directive the beam. Each antenna element has an RF transceiver transmitting or receiving the signal. 
Now, the biggest challenge in the system is to maintain the proper phase relationship between all of the elements for the beamformer to work properly. The phased ray systems adjust the phase at each element to steer the beam to the desired direction. And you can do this in a couple of ways. In a traditional analog beamforming system, you can use just one transceiver split the signal to multiple elements and adjust the phase in an analog fashion at each element. That will be a lot of analog phase shifters, which could be difficult to control and calibrate then. So the newer systems uh, transition to a digital beamformer or hybrid beamformer, where each element or a group of elements is supported by an independent transceiver. This gives better control over the phase adjustment to each element since it is done in the digital realm. And in these systems, uh, it is now the data converters that must properly be synchronized to maintain the proper phase relationship between elements. And therefore, clocking for those data converters is now very, very critical. Okay, I understand. So yes, the move to a digital beamformer can hopefully make this entire process of controlling the beam more, more efficient and more controllable with requiring less systems. But but why is clocking so important in these processes? And I guess, how exactly does it work? <laughs> yes. So we really want to ensure that the skew between the data converters clocks is minimized to ensure that all devices are properly synchronized. Because clock skew at the data converter level translate to a phase variation at the element which impacts the directivity of the beam. And in addition, you want those clock sources to have very low phase noise or clock jitter, as we had discussed in the beginning. So we need clock devices with excellent low clock jitter performance at high frequency while minimizing skew. And we really see that this is the key parameter for next generation beamformers. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess, you know, looking, thinking more broadly about the, the applications, the RF designers are, are usually trying to pack in as many elements as possible that can operate at high frequencies, but with agile beam steering capabilities. But at the same time, they're trying to reduce the PCB footprint and power consumption. You know, the, the swap C budget is still vital. And, um, as always, achieve the best signal chain performance. And I think when we're talking about satellite broadband, for example, the the, the performance is going to be vital because of the the nature of the of the application, right? And as this is a, becoming more and more of a of a commercial uh, use, well, this the nature of the market that <laughs> determines the the success. So, could you share maybe some insights, right, maybe to Michael, um, about how clocking solutions can help achieve high performance and maintain the kind of tight synchronization across all the channels with a, as little development effort as possible uh, required. We just discussed how the new systems are generally increasing the number of channels to get higher performing systems. And with that trend, you have to provide more integration to keep the systems compact and manageable while lowering also the power consumption so that the whole system doesn't just melt down from thermal overload. So new RF sampling transceiver devices are on the market now that integrate multiple channels onto one device and support RF frequency bands up to 12 gigahertz directly. So high frequency RF synthesizers provide the clock signal for the RF sampling data converters. The transceivers need a high frequency clock with very good phase noise, as we said before. And the systems today, they will be clocking up to 12 gigahertz. Yeah, and the future systems will push that to 20 gigahertz and beyond as technology moves on. So the clocking devices that provide good phase performance and are configurable provide the designer a lot of flexibility to select the clocking rate that best suits the system and the ability to mo modify it for, for different bands or applications. Maybe to add to this, the clocking devices not only need low part-to-part -part skew variation, 
they need the ability to adjust the clock phase. In large array systems, there will be phase skew between elements caused by device tolerance variations, temperature variations, and interconnect length variations, for example. So it is important to have a, the clock device adjust its phase to compensate for those variations in order to man maintain tight synchronization across all of the channels. And now, if you fail to do this, you will have to transmit or receive with increased power to compensate for less directive beam. Right, absolutely, which is obviously a situation we want to avoid. So that's, um, that's great, thank you. Are there any other uh, clocking elements that are typically used in phased array antenna systems that engineers need to know about? Yes, there are some other critical clocking parts typically used in the system. A clock chitter cleaner synchronizes the synthesizer's reference frequency to a system reference like 10 megahertz. These devices provide synchronized outputs to support the uh, synthesizer's reference, uh, FPGA clocks, and serializer system reference clock. And when dealing with large array systems, often a low phase noise clock distribution chip is, is needed to disseminate the low jitter clock to multiple devices without introducing any degradation of its own. So a, a good clock distribution device minimizes the number of RF synthesizers needed. And all of these clocking devices work together to form a complete clocking solution that maintain optimum performance for the phased array systems. Yeah, that's, that's well explained, Michael. Thanks. So we can really say, in summary, you are looking for clock devices with low jitter, low skew variation, and programmable to mitigate variation in other parts of the system. Right, excellent. Low jitter, low skew variation, and high programmability or programmable to yeah give you give you great control efficiently. So that makes sense. Um, now. I understand that there are some kind of established standards for high-speed data capture designs that use um, FPGAs, uh, and you, you mentioned the, the importance of using FPGA clocks and, and how they can help the synchronization of the system. I'm aware, for example, of JSD204, which I understand is becoming more popular for terrestrial high-speed applications. How suitable is this standard because of its, you know, because it is established and being used? How suitable is it? or equivalent standards uh, to be used in satellites as opposed to on the ground? Yes. So actually, for ultra high-speed data sampling, there is no really an alternative to GSD-204. Uh, we are really living in a very data-hungry world, and we must transfer multiple gigabits per second in a single modulated data stream. So. A new trend to cover this is RF sampling. This trend supports very flexible form of modulation, but it's ne it needs high bandwidth between FPGA and the data converters. This is where GSD-204 comes into play. It supports serial connections with embedded clocks. And now with the new GSD-204C, we can easily reach 10 to 32 gigabits per second on each lane between FPGA and converter. The similar principle is known by PCI Express in the PC world. So multiple of those lanes can be combined uh, to form a higher speed uh, uh, connection if needed. I see, I see. Okay, so GSD-204 helps support the serial connections with embedded clocks, I understand, but you know, enables high ultra high speed data sampling. But how exactly does JSD two hundred four support space applications? I mean, maybe if we could translate it to the applications themselves, that would be great. And Michael, perhaps you could answer. Yeah, good, good question. So let's look now how the standard supports space applications. Uh, starting with the JSD two hundred four B, the standard contains synchronization methods which are very relevant for sp space. Let me explain now why. First we must take a quick look at some of the typical space problems. Besides the well-known thermal issues, we have mainly one big problem, and that is the radiation. 
If a high energy particle is hitting our well-designed and crafted circuit, it could displace some electrons and by that cause some false switching. Well, that is not a big deal. False data from false switching is typically corrected by some error correction. However, there is one much more severe condition from which recovery is not so easy. It is called latch up. This is when an integrated device or any IC suddenly causes kind of a soft short circuit on its power rails. And the only safe way to resolve this issue is by cutting the power from the affected part for a short moment. Now, this power cycle ends the latch up and lets everything work fine again. And here, here comes the catch, actually. A complete system shutdown interrupts all thousands of data streams instantly, right? So, and, and, and it takes quite some time until all is up and running again. So we want really something with less impact, like, for example, a partial solution, right? It would be helpful to just restart the component, which failed, because it goes rather quick compared to a full system shutdown. Yes, exactly. And, and this is where JSD 2.4b helps us with its synchronization methods, like a sysref signal. It reestablishes system clock phases, and it also helps quickly recover communication on the lanes between the converter and the FPGA. So this makes it possible to power cycle exactly the one affected device while keeping the remainder of the system alive. The partial system can maintain functionality during the events, so the impact is minimal and restore the full usability in very short time. Uh, this is more or less like switching off and on a light bulb compared to a complete reboot of a PC. <laughs> right, that's great. That's uh, yeah, that's very understandable. Thank you. As always, the the harsh environment of space in, in it requires us to do some <laughs> crazy things on the engineering side to uncover to account for problems that we don't face on the ground. But that's great. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you give us some an example or some examples of space related applications or any case studies that would really require this use of high performance, tightly synchronized clocking to each of the channels um, using kind of gigahertz clocking tree solutions. Yes, uh, no problem, Hal. So probably the most known application um, is the recently launched Leo Constellation to bring broadband access to any region of the world. In these constellations, the phased array antennas bring value to both ends of the communication channel, to the user link and also to the so-called feeder link, which connects the satellite with the operator's ground station. Well, okay, how does this work? How does beamforming help in each of these, or in this use case? How does beamforming help? Yeah, let me let me start with the user link. So the user link establishes the connection between the individual subscribers and the satellite. Uh, with the ability of electrically steering multiple beams, each satellite can divide the area it serves and provide each of these subs areas their own frequency band. And now the high agility is needed as the satellites in the low Earth orbit are flying by with quite some speed over ground. This means the beam sent to Earth must move with the inverse of the ground speed to keep an optimal connection. And let me add to this, right? The, the user's link's endpoint may not necessarily be on ground. It can also be on an airplane to provide broadband access to flight passengers. Exactly. And the second link, the, the feeder link, builds the connection between the satellite and the ground station, which uh, are connected to operators' terrestrial network. Also, for this link, the beam must steer inverse to satellite movement over ground to keep the best possible field strength between the two antennas. And now the moment the satellite moves close to the horizon, it will lose that connection and the beam must quickly turn to the next base station on its way. Right, got it. Okay, yeah. So we've got essentially two or three elements in the system, all of which are moving <laughs> relative to each other. So the beam forming is, is always going to be required at those different things. So, okay, got it. Um, Michael, I wonder if you could elaborate on any other applications besides the, the satellite broadband. Yeah, of course, right. There are many more applications, of course, that benefit from phased array antennas. One I uh, 
to highlight is uh, for sure the Earth observation missions. A very prominent example for this could be the Rose L mission as part of ESA's latest additions to the Copernicus Earth Observation Program. So the Rose L really carries a, syn a synthetic aperture radar with a phased array antenna operating at roughly 1.3 gigahertz. And we can even add a third application field, so we, we, which is uh, rather observation systems. The multi-beam capability enables this system to follow multiple objects, such as airplanes or satellites, at the same time. In future, such application could also be used for collision avoidance to mitigate the increased risk for satellites from space junk. Interesting. Yeah, obviously a, an area of huge interest in um, today's industry. So thank you, Adrian. Well, you, that leads into my next question, really. You mentioned the, the potential future applications. So I wondered how you saw um, this, this idea of you know, using gigahertz clocking tree solutions in phased array antennas, how you saw this evolving in space applications over the next, I don't know, like five years or so. I guess, Adrian, if you want to continue... <laughs> Yeah, that's very interesting. There are indeed several trends that will make high-performance clocking tree even more important. We see RF sampling up to X-band, so 8 to 12 gigahertz, being already reality as of today. As innovation continues, RF sampling will also be possible at even higher frequencies. And we do see a strong trend towards even higher bands, such as the KU, K, or KA band. Obviously, this was always comes with the need for clocking at such high frequencies. And as mentioned in the beginning, the higher the frequency, the more demanding the requirements on the clock signal in terms of phase noise and skew. Let me add to this. The second major trend is the growing demand of phased array antennas that enable electronically steered RF beams with high agility and strong spatial selectivity, as we discussed. And interestingly, the other spacing between antenna elements is inversely proportional to the frequency phased array antennas operate at. For example, if you double the frequency, you must reduce the spacing by half. In other words, you will have four times the number of elements in the same area. And as a result, we will see the need for even more data converters per antenna system that will need to be supplied with a high quality and perfectly synchronized clock. Uh, this will also create a need for even higher integration for smaller footprints and lower power consumption. So in summary, the trend goes clearly to higher frequency hence stricter performance requirements in terms of phase noise and skew and towards an increasing number of endpoints that must be synchronized right interesting yeah and obviously we're, we're looking at satellite systems with a specific um, you know physical footprint budget that needs to be filled then these considerations are, are very important to the rf designers to the the you know how it integrates with the rest of the satellite system how these things are powered um, and and controlled uh, ultimately by the by the satellite computer system. So that's great. I mean, this this is a really interesting topic. As I said, this is is very technical, but the potential that is bringing to applications that I think you've explained really clearly here with things like the satellite broadband um, area are, are great. So I think I guess finally, if any, if people are really interested, uh, you know, particularly satellite RF designers who are really looking to incorporate some of these systems and ideas and, and technologies into their own systems. Do you have any pointers on resources or information where they could where they could follow up this this topic? Yes, yes. Uh, TI has a wealth of material on, on this topic at ti.com. So first of all, I would strongly suggest to take a look at uh, TI's leading clocking products such as the LMX2615-SP, which is our space-grade uh, wideband synthesizer working from 40 MHz to 15 GHz, which supports GSD204, or LMK04832-SP, which is um, our uh, space-grade uh, clock jitter, also with JSD support, and several others you can find on ti.com. All this 
comes with uh, the respective evaluation module and great wealth of software support, including the new online tool, which is called Clock Tree Architect. This uh, is helping generating a clock tree solution that meets your requirements. Right. Yeah, and further, I would recommend designers to take a look at the material on TI's space applications webpage, ti.com slash space. There you can find plenty of application materials and reference designs, including test and measurement results. These help getting a quick impression on the performance potential or to get a head start into development with example schematics and layouts to refer to. So for example, you will find there a complete high-speed data acquisition system, which is based on TI's ADC 12 DJ3200 QMLV-SP. This is a 12-bit 6.4 giga samples per second RF sampling ADC. And that design includes also the full space grade power tree and clocking tree as well. Exactly. And in addition, I would like to encourage designers to take advantage of the very popular Precision Lab training series provided on training.ti.com. There are several short trainings on high-speed clocking and high-speed data conversion systems. These short videos provide great insights on how the semiconductor products work and how the characterization parameters are defined and why they are important. The precision lab trainings are actually very popular. The target audience for this is very broad. We see newcomers that appreciate to get started on the topic quickly, or even experienced engineers that want to refresh their knowledge from the school or just interested to get a deeper look into the semiconductor products. Even for those who worked on RF technology for decades, it is really sometimes good to take a step back and see what design challenges could, could meanwhile be resolved with an integrated circuit where several years ago only discrete solutions were thinkable. Absolutely. I think um, the industry is moving so fast that, uh, you know, even the, the most experienced RF designers maybe have not had to think too specifically about how they're going to enable satellite broadband connection on airplanes or multi-element radar uh, tracking of space debris uh, in LEO that's, uh, yeah, that, and these sort of applications are now possible. So I think that um, refreshing knowledge and trainings like this is, is great. And um, just to say to the listeners, we link to all of these resources that are mentioned in the show notes. So you don't have to worry too much about remembering those acronyms and um, we can uh, link through to the ti.com tools and, and resources we found here. So that's fantastic. Thank you. I think that's a really great place to wrap up. So our listeners will have learned a great deal today about the use of face array antennas, the, the processes that need to be carried out to optimize beamforms and the, the importance of gigahertz clocking solutions uh, at all stages. And, and I think it's great to understand how these technologies are changing aspects of the industry, how they could also make a difference in the applications of tomorrow. And um, importantly, how the, the kind of fundamental physics and engineering that goes behind what decisions have to be made by engineers when developing space-based uh, solutions to this. And indeed, as you've pointed out, the, the importance of the beam forming on the, on the terrestrial side, on the end user side. So um, I, I'd like to thank you both very, very much for being uh, spending time with us today on the Space Industry Podcast and, and sharing these insights and knowledge. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. And to all of our listeners out there, I'd also like to thank you for spending time with us on the Space Industry Podcast. Um, you can find out more about Text Instruments, of course, at ti.com, as well as on the, the pages on SatSearch that we have for the company. And as I mentioned, we'll link to the resources that have been referenced in the show notes. And if you have any uh, any further questions for our speakers and, or any questions on procurement and on the portfolio of Text Instruments, we will um, be more than happy to help you get answers to those. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Space Industry by SatSearch. I hope you enjoyed today's story about one of the companies taking us into orbit. We'll be back soon with more in-depth, behind-the-scenes insights from private space businesses. 
In the meantime, you can go to setsearch.com for more information on the space industry today or find us on social media if you have any questions or comments. To stay up to date, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can also get each podcast on demand on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Play Store or whichever podcast service you typically use.